preach just a little while from this, this verse, Ephesians chapter number 5, verse number 16. Back last, last May, we were up at the uh, Fellowship Track League, and if you've ever been in that church, Fellowship Baptist Church, they've got a, a middle aisle and two sections on each side of the aisle, one over here and one over here. And this particular meeting last year, not, not two weeks ago when we were there, but uh, last year, when we get in the service, we sat about three quarters of the way back on this side over here. And I tell everybody the reason why we sat so far back is because my wife was backslid that week. And, and she looked at me and said, no, nah, that was you that week. And, but the reason why we sat so far back is because I've got daughters and girls that I travel with and we're just always late. So we get there, and there's nowhere to sit. And once you get a seat in the meeting, there's no moving. I mean, you, you ain't going to go around and move somebody's Bibles because a Baptist will cut your hand off. So you're pretty well staying in that seat where you are the whole meeting. And from my vantage point where I was sitting, looking right over whoever was in the pulpit, whether it's a song leader somebody singing a special or whether it was the preacher or the pastor giving announcements or whatever looking right over that person's left shoulder from where I was sitting preacher they had a banner on the wall about right there where that light deal is and, and that banner had this verse Ephesians chapter number 5 verse number 16 redeeming the time because the days are evil and my mind was, was basically focused on that verse. It didn't matter what was going on. I was thinking, and I, you say that's terrible, not listen to the preaching. No, I was listening to the preaching. But my every thought about preaching when it was going to be my turn was on Ephesians chapter number 5 and verse number 16. And while I was sitting there in that meeting, I got to thinking about the second half of that verse. Because the days are evil. And I'm amazed uh, preacher, as we go from church to church, we're in church just about every night of my life. I mean, we're, we're somewhere either singing, singing and preaching, in camp meetings, whatever. And I'm amazed at some of the conversations we hear in Baptist churches. And I'm Baptist from the top of my head to the bottom of my feet. Been Baptist nine months before I was ever born. And I know I'm not saved because I'm a Baptist preacher, but I believe we Baptists are as close to that book as far as doctrine is concerned than any other denomination on the planet. I'm so convinced of the doctrines of that book. If I found another denomination that was closer than Baptist, I, that's what I'd be. Right, right. Yes, sir. But I know we're not saved because we Baptists, but I believe we saved and on our way to heaven, and I believe because we're Baptists, we're going first class. Yeah, all right. Yeah, yeah, but I'm amazed in these Baptist churches that we're, that we're in at the conversations of, I can't believe the president did this. Did you hear what the politicians did today? Can you believe what's going on in the Ukraine? Can you believe the fires out in California? Can you believe they just had another earthquake here and there? And when they make those statements, preacher, it's almost like everything that's going on from 27 months ago when COVID hit till now, it's almost Baptist people think that all this stuff has kind of snuck up on God. It's kind of blindsided him, took him by surprise. But he made this statement in these verses under the inspiration. Paul made these statements under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost because the days were evil. It's almost like he knew yeah. Yeah. You're right. that the days were going to be evil. And it shouldn't take us by surprise what the president does. He's just doing what a lost man does. It shouldn't take us by surprise what the politicians do. They're just doing what lost people do. It, took, it shouldn't take us by surprise what the evil... Uh, people do in this world, what the wicked do in this world, that shouldn't take us by surprise. The Lord said there's going to be wars and rumors of wars. He said there's going to be famines, there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be disease, there's going to be fires, there's going to be earthquakes. But he did say when you see these things approaching
approach him. Look up, lift up your head, for your redemption draweth nigh. Paul admonished us time and time again. Perilous times are going to come. Put on the whole armor of God. There's going to be all the stuff that's going to happen. There's going to be the, 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 the those that wax evil. There's going to be those the seducers. There's going to be the whoremongers. There's going to be the adulterers. He said all these things are going to arise and seemingly take priority and take spot. But the Lord said, you don't worry about it as a child of God. I know all about it because the days are evil. He says, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. He says, it was as in the days of Lot, so shall it also be in the coming of the Son of Man. And I believe we are the generation right now that's living in those days of Noah and those days as it were of Lot all at the same time. Everything the government's trying to push down our throat, everything that's against our Bible, everything that's against our God, everything that's against church. I mean, it's no wonder they're trying to push sodomy down our throat. It's no wonder they're trying to push abortion down our throat and say it's okay. There's no wonder they're trying to push everything that's wicked and vile because he said in the days of Noah that men's hearts waxed evil it continually and the, the wickedness of man's thoughts was only evil continually and everything that went on in Lot's day. We are living in those days because the days are evil. He's warned us about it. We ought not bury our head in the sand just because the days are evil. It's not time to retreat. It's not time to back up. It's not time to sit down or shut up. It's time for us as the people of God to walk out in this world and tell them what thus saith the word of the Lord. Let them know that there's judgment coming. Let them know if they reject the blood of Jesus Christ, it's hell forever and forever. God's done said, I'm coming back. You might as well get ready for it. I am on my way. And I believe we're in the last of the last days because the days are evil. But most Baptist people sit on their stool and do nothing and they sing their favorite song I shall not be moved. But these verses have a lot of instruction for us as the people of God just because the days are evil. These verses from the end of chapter number 4 all the way to chapter number 5, verse number 16 tell us a lot about our walk. The verse right before this, verse number 15 says, walk circumspectly. I believe it's verse number 2 says, walk not as fools. Preacher, he tells us how we're supposed to walk even in these because the days are evil days. He tells us that we're supposed to walk and not just act like Christians, but be what we are. Don't just act like a Christian, be one. I mean, you just go ahead and let this whole world know that because you're evil don't mean that I have to be evil. Because you're trying to push this stuff down my throat don't mean I have to cower down. I have to back down. I can stand my ground because I am a child of the king. I know what the Bible says about what's right and about what's wrong. And friend, he tells us a lot about how we're supposed to walk. Not with our heads tucked. But we're to walk through this world proclaiming what thus saith the word of God. That's how we're supposed to walk. Walking after Christ. Following our example. How we're supposed to walk in this because the days are evil world. But not only our walk. These verses have a lot to say about how our work is supposed to be. He used these verses. Occupy till I come. And preacher, I, I, honestly, I talk about Baptists because I are one. I don't know about the Methodists. I don't know about the Presbyterian. I don't know about the Catholics. I don't know about the atheists. The only thing I don't understand about the atheists is how can they be mad at somebody they don't even know, believe exists? How can you be so angry against somebody you don't even think exists? That's always bothered me. But these verses occupy till I come. Most Baptists believe that word occupy means just take up space. But that's not what it means. 
It means, as the Lord would put it, be busy about our Father's business. That's what I'm supposed to be doing, preacher. I'm to be salt and I'm to be light. As a child of God, not necessarily a preacher, because everybody can be salt and everybody can be light. You don't have to be called to preach. You don't have to be called to be a missionary. You don't have to be an evangelist. You can be salt and light wherever you go. You can tell somebody what the Lord's done for you. That's the work you have to do. As a child of God, you ought to go out as that salt. You ought to go out as that light, pointing women to the, to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, letting them know that he's the only way to heaven. That's the work all of us are supposed to be doing. It tells us a lot about our walk. It tells us a lot about our work. But these verses tell us a lot about worship. How I'm supposed to worship. Not ashamed. Because Christ has already extinguished that. If you're ashamed of me, I'll be ashamed of you. He's already let us know that if you're going to worship me, he told that woman at the well, you've got to worship me in spirit and in truth. I'm glad my spirit bears witness with his spirit that I am a child of God. And because of what he's done for me on the cross of Calvary, and basically just the fact that because of who he is, that ought to make me want to worship him. Whether I'm out there, whether I'm in here, I ought to be, be uh, uh, brave enough and bold enough to lift up my hands, whether I'm standing at the line at the grocery store and telling God how good he is, or whether I'm sitting in a restaurant about to eat a steak, telling God how great he is, I ought to let him know how worthy he is because he is worthy of my worship and praise. That ought to be, the, the world has zapped that out of us. But we've got the truth. I've read the last chapter. We've already won. I'm on the winning side. And that ought to make me want to worship him because I don't have to go to hell, preacher. I'll never, ever, ever, no matter how many times they tell me out there, I'm never going there. My feet will never feel the flames of hell. I'll never feel one ounce of the flames of hell on this body because I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven and I ought to worship him and act like that's where I'm going. Because I've heard it said all my life, this is the quietest world you're ever going to live in. If you go to heaven, there's going to be shouting all over the street of glory. Yes. Bowing down at his feet. Those cherubims and seraphims ought not have nothing on us. Right. And if you die and go to hell right. by your own choice, yeah. right. there's going to be the weeping and wailing and the gnashing of teeth. There's going to be a lot of noise. Yep. Right. And the fact that I'm on my way to heaven... It makes me ought to worship him more and more. As the day draws closer and closer, it makes me want to worship him even more. The fact of the stuff that he spared me from. I got saved at 12 years old, almost 13, almost a teenager, almost knew everything, but not, not at 12. And when God saved me at that age, he not only saved my soul, but he saved my life. I don't have a lot of the scars that this world has, preacher. I don't have a lot of the scars from a drunken daddy or, or a drunken life myself or a dopehead life myself. I don't have those scars. And I used to, it used to always bother me because I didn't have that kind of testimony. But friend, I'm glad looking at some of my friends yeah. now who are in bad health because of the choices they made, because of the scars of this world on their life. I'm glad I don't have those scars. And I ought to praise him that he not only saved my soul, but he saved my life. And these verses tell us because the days are evil how we're to work and how we're to walk and how we're to worship because the days are evil. But let's go back to the first half. Redeeming the time. That lets me know, preacher, that I ought to spend every waking moment of the time I have left by the help and mercy of God and the grace of God, I ought to be wanting to spend every moment that I have because the days are evil lifting him up. Yes, amen. That ought to be the desire of all of us right. amen. to spend every waking moment redeeming our time for the cause of Christ. Yeah. Number one, in the days that I have left, by the help and grace of God, because I know I can't do it on my own. 
I want to redeem my time, number one, being faithful. I'm going to throw a truth bomb on you. I'm 51 years old, preacher. Not one time in my life has the Lord ever came to me and asked me to die for him. <clears throat> Not one time, church, has the Lord in my 51 years on this earth has he ever asked me to die for him. Now I ought to be willing to die daily to this flesh. And if time comes when somebody points a gun in my head, if that time ever comes right here in the United States of America where somebody points a, head, a gun in my head and says, you renounce Christ or die, I ought to be willing to take that bullet. But as far as the 51 years I've had on this earth, that has never happened. And I dare say, unless you've been to China or somewhere like that in, in some of these foreign countries, I dare say it's not happened to either one of y'all either. We ought to be willing to. But as far as the Lord coming to us and asking us to die for us, preach, die for him, preacher, that's never happened in my life that I know of. But over and over and over and over and over and time 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 again through that Bible right there, he's asked us to live for him. He's asked us just to be faithful. It's required of a steward, the Bible says, that a man be found faithful. And I don't know as wicked and vile and as worthless as all of us are how we can expect a holy and a righteous God to be faithful to us all the time. We expect it, preacher. And he said he's going to do it. David said, I'm, I, I once was young, now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. David told us that the Lord told him that he's going to take care of him. He is going to be faithful. And we know that God is going to be faithful to us. But somehow or another, we've got to the place where we expect it. When we're hot or cold, we expect God to be faithful. When we're up or down, in or out, happy, sad, glad, whatever the term is you want to use, our faithfulness can teeter-totter. But yet we expect in a thrice holy God to hold up his end of the bargain all the time. It ought to be the desire of every one of us, saved by the grace of God, before our feet ever hit the floor in the mornings is to ask God, by your help, grace, and mercy, God help us to be faithful today. Yeah. That ought to be the desire of everyone in the building. God, I just want to be faithful today. I want to be faithful to do your walk. I want to be faithful to do your work. I want to be faithful to worship. I want to be faithful to witness. That ought to be the desire of every one of us. It's just to say, hey, God help me to be faithful. I want to redeem my time. Yeah. Because the days are evil. By the help and good grace of God, I want to be faithful. I want to strive every day, preacher, just to walk down that faithful path because I'm expecting him to be. And he's expecting me to be. I want to be faithful. But number two, because the days are evil, I not only want to redeem my time being faithful, I want to redeem my time because the days are evil being joyful now this walks right up to all of us and pops every one of us in the mouth for the last 15 16 years preacher I've tried my best when I walk into a Baptist church because that's all we go to when I walk into a Baptist church I have stopped forced myself to stop asking people how they doing because that's a loaded question. That is a loaded question. And I'm not making fun or light of anybody having ADD. But my ADD mind won't let me stand there for 30 minutes and listen to how bad you got it. If I slip up and ask it, and Baptist people start to back in their truck up and dumping all that stuff on me, my mind starts seeing flying squirrels. And I have to look at him. and say, oh, I'm sorry, were you talking to me? Because <laughs> Baptist people are going to tell you how bad it is at the job. They're going to tell you how bad it is at the house. They're going to tell you how bad politics are. 
They're going to tell you how bad their basketball team is. Yeah. They're going to tell you how bad their dog and cats are. Right. They're going to tell you how bad they have it uh, physically. They're going to tell you how bad they have it mentally. Right. They're going to tell you how bad they got it psychologically. They're going to tell you how bad the weather is. They're going to tell you how bad everything is. Yeah. And as that old black lady said, ain't nobody got time for that. <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> so my saying is now, it's good to see you. Yeah, good to see you. That's all I say. Yeah. If I slip up and ask you, this is going to sound rude, crude, and insensitive. If I slip up and ask you, we really don't care. <laughs> That's terrible, preacher. That is terrible. But, but honestly, do we? The, if you ask that question 10 times a day, do you really care about all ten how you, that you ask? It's just a, con it's a conversation starter. Yeah, right. But Baptist people that take it as an opportunity to get their foot in the door yeah. and pour all their junk all over you. Let's, let's, go, let's go hypothetical. Hypothetical. You're walking downtown Main Street, Florence, if there is such a place. It, most, most places ain't got that no more. But let's just say there is. Hypothetical. Hypothetical. Let's just say there is. You got your honey by the hand. Y'all just taking a stroll through downtown. Maybe you got a grandbaby. You're pushing in the little stroller in the car. Or maybe you're just walking your dog. Maybe y'all just out catching some of the summer night air. Whatever. And you see somebody on that end of the street headed towards you that you ain't seen in a long time. You know them from, from elementary school or maybe high school. Maybe you went to college with them. Maybe you grew up in the same neighborhood with them. They coming towards you and from their testimony, of, from the testimony of other people, mutual friends, you know they're not saved. You know it. Just maybe by their look. And we real good at judging that too. We just know they ain't saved. And they walk up to you downtown Main Street, Florida. You ain't seen them in forever. And they ask you that loaded question. How you doing? And you start telling them how bad it is at the church. And how bad it is on the job. How bad it is at the house. And all them other things that I listed just a little while ago. And then somehow or another the conversation turns to you. And you think, well maybe I ought to tell them about Jesus. They not going to want what you got. They going to think within their own minds, hey, I got enough trouble as a lost man. I don't need all my lost man troubles and all their saved man troubles piled up on top of me. And they going to walk away from you the same way. When the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is our strength, it don't matter how bad it is around us. It don't matter how bad the circumstances are. They can be as bad as they've ever been. But God is still good. And God can heal all your circumstances. God can heal all their circumstances. And we need to let them know that God is good no matter how how bad it is all around us. That ought to be what joy does to us. We ought to tell them it really don't matter how bad it is. God's got your answer. He knows exactly what you need through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to redeem my time. And that ought to be everybody. We ought to redeem our time being joy. I mean, that ought to just pop to every one of us. Because we all get the pooch lip. Right. We all get that uh, happiness as being affected by circumstances yeah. when our joy ought to stay the same. Yeah. Because God's good. Yeah. All the time. Yeah. No matter how bad it is, God's still good. Yeah. I want to redeem my time because the days are evil. Right. Being faithful. Being joyful. But number three. I want to redeem my time because the days are evil being fruitful. Fruitful. You're not taking the 401ks, will you? And I'm not against having 401k. You're not taking the house, the land. If you think the, the wife's going to give you the savings, she'll write it in a check form and put it in your casket. But you're not taking it. 
Job said naked came I into this world naked I shall return you're not taking any of the goods and I'm not against having goods but it ain't going to heaven we but what you can take to heaven is your kids preacher what we can take is our grandkids we can make sure that they know we can make sure that my little year old grandson and my little three month old granddaughter, I can make sure that their mom and dad is teaching them the way. Because right. Right. I want them to go to heaven with me. Right. Right. I want them to be present, preacher, when they call the names out on the road. I want them to be able to stand up and say, here I am because mom and daddy told me about the Savior. Because grandma and grandpa told me about the Savior. Because they wanted to bring me here. Yeah. They made sure I knew. Yeah. We got a Pentecostal friend of ours. Just passed away about a year and a half ago, preacher. His church was the Tabernacle of Love. Right there in Blacksburg, right across the road from my in law's house. It's down a little hill and it looks like a little airplane hangar. One of them rounded off buildings. And it's called the Tabernacle of Love. Brother Lucky. That's his birth certificate name. I said, Brother Lucky, how'd you get the name Lucky? He said, when my mom was carrying me, she fell down a flight of stairs. My grandma looked at her after she found out she is all right and said, if that baby makes it, he'll be lucky. <laughs> and that's exactly what she named her son. Lucky Earls was his name. And Brother Lucky, the little Pentecostal church, he's, he's a great fellow. Knew, knew that he's saved by grace, had a great testimony. Some of the other stuff he believed, now I, I wasn't for. But Brother Lucky loved winning people to God. And it was by grace through faith. That's, how, that's what he preached. They didn't know how long they'd keep it, but that's what he preached, by grace through faith. And every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Brother Lucky told us, that he started off every service just like this. He said, when I first started preaching, I'd get in my pulpit on Sunday morning and he'd say, I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven and I want to take a bus load with me when I go. Sunday night, come back. I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven I want to take a bus load with me when I go. Wednesday night, the same phrase. I'm saved, I'm on my way to heaven and I want to take a bus load with me when I go. And said, after about two or three months of standing up in the in my pulpit every service kicking it off with that saying I had one of my old ladies stand up and said Brother Lucky we glad that you saved and you on your way to heaven but why are you just limiting yourself to a bus load she said about the biggest bus I've ever seen only hold 55 people She said, Brother Lucky, why don't you say that you saved and on your way to heaven and you want to take a train load? As far as I could see a cars on that train, you want to take that train load full. And Brother Lucky said, from that service on, I stood up in my pulpit Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, and I started off like this. I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven and I want to take a train load of people with us. Amen. When I go, that ought to be our desire. Amen. That ought to be everybody's desires to want everybody to go to heaven. You don't want your family lifting their eyes as the rich man did and in hell he lifted his eyes. You don't want your co-workers or your neighbors and in hell they lift his eyes, their eyes. Friend, you don't want that. You want them saved because you're saved. You know how good God is. You've heard about how good heaven is. You ought to want to be fruitful in these last of the last days because the days are evil. But number four, and I'm done. I want to redeem my time being faithful and being joyful and being fruitful. But because the days are evil, I want to redeem my time being watchful. The Bible says, Matthew 24, for in such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man coming. Preach, I believe we're in that think not generation. We've hear, we hear it all the time. Y'all been saying that for over 2,000 years. Y'all said that 2,000 years ago. Paul was saying it in his day. And it still ain't happened. Well, I want you to know that's the only thing left for God to do. 
As far as God's prophetical time clock is concerned, the rapture of the church is the only thing left. Right. Everything else has been taken care of. That's the only thing left is for us to be snatched away, caught up to meet the Lord in the air. And if he didn't come today, I ought to be expecting him tomorrow. And if he don't come tomorrow, I ought to be expecting him tomorrow night. And if he don't come tomorrow night, I ought to be expecting him the next day. Because he's going to do what he said he's going to do. God's going to fulfill his promise. He's going to come and take us out of here. And we ought to be watching with everything that's going on all over the world. Yeah. Let me give you this story, and I'm, we're going to the house. I've got a brother that's 13 months older than I am. 13 years after I was born, my mama had a set of twin boys. So, But for the first 13 years of my life, preacher, just me and my oldest brother. And from about age three or four, when we started playing t-ball and 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 little league football, little league baseball, little league basketball, from about that age till I went to college. Just about every day of my life, we had our whole basketball team or a whole baseball team or a whole football team at our house. Just about any given day, there was 8, 10, 12 boys at our house. And all we did was play ball. We didn't have time for girls. All we wanted to do was play ball. That's all we wanted to do. It didn't matter if it was springtime, summertime, fall, or winter. We was playing ball at our house. My daddy put us up a real nice basketball goal. We had a big field behind our house, preacher. We could play football. We could play baseball. I mean, we had a pretty good-sized lot back there. And every day, school time, after school, all these boys were at our house. I heard my mama say, especially during the summer, y'all boys born in the barn? Y'all done left that back door open again. You're letting all the air out. Get outside. You're tracking mud in this house. Ain't no more coke in the refrigerator. Y'all done eat up all the chips. The light in the refrigerator still works. Quit opening the door to check it. Get outside. <laughs> Heard that all my life. And we'd play ball. Summertime, pouring sweat. There wasn't no street lights in our neighborhood. We made sure of that. <laughs> BB guns and street lights didn't go too good together. We were on the edge of the city limits, and preacher, there just wasn't no light. So when it got dark about 9, 30, 10 o'clock in the summertime, we always called it pitch black dark. I mean, you couldn't hardly see your hand. Unless the moon was shining, you couldn't see your hand in front of your face. It was dark, dark. And about when it turned dark, some of these boys at our house would always say, after we done got done playing ball, they'd always say, let's play hide and go seek. Some of y'all's been there. I can just tell by the way you just laugh. They said, let's play hide and go seek. Problem is with these fellas is they had no idea where my mom's clothesline was. <laughs> no idea. I mean, it was steel frame back then. It was that real metal stuff. I mean, it wasn't going to give. T-frame at the top, three lines going down to another T-frame down there on the bottom. And when we come from my granddaddy's house that lived right behind us, if you didn't know when to duck and jump at the same time to miss the ditch, you're just gone. <laughs> that thing's going to catch you about the neck and you're just going to be down for the count for a little while. They had no idea where that, that was. They had no idea where my daddy's shed was, A-frame shed in our backyard between our house and my granddad's house. The tin on that shed came down to right at six foot. And there wasn't no protection stuff. If you five foot eight, five foot nine, you could run under that bad boy without missing a beat. But if you six foot or more, cut across here, a little taller, you might be cut across here. You was going to the hospital to get some stitches. There was no doubt. And a tetanus shot. Because that tin was rusty. You was going. They had no idea where they They didn't know where the six poles were, preacher, that held that shed up. Dark brown telephone poles. You're not seeing them in the pitch black dark. You're not going to see them. You're going to run right smack dab into them, and they're not going to move. They had no idea where our outside basement steps were. You come down off our back porch, out from under our carport, you took about three steps, you turned to the right, 
And if you didn't know them basement steps, you gone. I mean, we're going to be calling ambulance to you. Broken leg, cracked head, concussion, everything. You was going to have to go to the hospital because they was all cement block. These boys didn't have no idea. But I did. <laughs> I had all the jumps and the steps just timed out perfect all my life. I lived there. But not these boys. Fellas, I'm game. Y'all want to play? We good for it. Let's play. Start off with big taters. Big taters turned to little taters. And whoever had taters left was it. And the person that had taters left would always ask, what's base? And on the front of our house, our brick house, preacher, there was a chest high, just about brick porch. Dark brown. Five steps. No lights. You're not seeing this porch. If you come around our house running alongside the house, you're going to run smack dab into it. And you're going to start breathing like this. <gasps> and they're going to say, you need water? No, I need air. I need air. Because it'd catch you and knock the wind out of you. These boys didn't know that. The newbies didn't know. But the person would sit down on our steps where it was base. They'd put their head on the step above them. And you'd hear throughout our pitch black neighborhood, one, two, and just about every time before they said three, they'd look up cheating it didn't matter it's dark they could cheat all they wanted to they wasn't seeing where nobody was going but they'd always cover up their cheating preacher with what am I supposed to count to and you'd hear that ring throughout our neighborhood what am I supposed to count to and the 8, 10, 12 boys all reverberated some of them sound like they done already made it 6 miles up the road You'd hear, 50, 50, 50, count to 50, 50, 50, 50. I mean, it, everybody that was hiding was hollering, count to 50. So I guess that person got the message. Count to 50. They'd sit right down. They'd start again. One, two, and about 45 seconds later, you'd hear, 47, 48. 49 and every time every time at 49 somebody's going to holler not ready <laughs> and my thinking is it's dark just stand still lay down on the ground they not going to see you you just told them where all of us was so that counter when somebody holler not ready they'd say 49 49 quarter Four nine and a half. Four nine and three quarters. Four nine and nine tenths. And somebody's hollering again. Not ready. Not ready. But the second not ready didn't count. The counter would always say, 50. Ready or not. Here I come. And somehow or another, I got to believe the Lord's on about 48. He might be hitting 49. And somebody preacher that's maybe watching by live stream right now, they just hollered out, not ready. Maybe somebody sitting in this auditorium, you just hollered out, not ready. Not ready. And the Lord with all his grace and mercy and temperance and long suffering, he's probably saying 49 and a quarter. He might be on 49 and three quarters and they're still hollering, not ready. Not ready. And we're about to hear 50. Ready or not. Here I come. And because the days are evil. Because the days are evil. We ought to be watching, preacher. We ought to be expecting it. Probably most of you, when you lay down tonight, 
You can probably think about one of them boys hitting my grandma or my mama's clothesline. You're probably going to think about them maybe falling over in our basement steps or running into the porch or hitting my daddy's shed. And you're probably going to chuckle. But right after you laugh, you're going to hear somebody and probably somebody's going to come to your mind that's hollering, Not ready. Not ready. And because we're watchful, we ought to try our best to be fruitful. And we can't be fruitful unless we're joyful. And you can't be joyful unless you're faithful. Because the days are evil. We ought to redeem our time. He could come back at any moment. And maybe some of our family members is hollering, Not ready. Maybe some of them 30 year workers you've been working with is hollering, Not ready. Maybe some of them lifetime neighbors, they might be hollering, Not ready. We ought to be working and walking. Because the days are evil. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.